in the talk. And uh, as I was saying, so it's a pleasure to him. Go on, Yanis, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, uh, I thank Daniele for this uh, kind invitation, and indeed, uh, many of the things that uh, I will mention, we did it in uh, collaboration with him, with Christina Aguilar and uh, others, as you will see. So I would like to talk uh, today about emergence of scale in the gate sector of QCT, or at least uh, the way we understand it uh, right now uh, within our uh, way of doing things. Uh, let's see if I can, if I, all ah, right, okay. So I, I want to start with uh, the notion of uh, emergence, which is relatively new and it has been uh, put forth by Craig Roberts in a series of uh, papers and uh, many uh, workshops. And um, it's the observation that uh, somehow out of a set of uh, seemingly uh, simple rules, you get an enormous uh, complexity and you can uh, try to uh, interpret the resulting complexity out of these basic rules. Now at the level of uh, QCD, uh, that means that one starts out with the QCD Lagrangian. So here I have written uh, explicitly the um, part that uh, is related to the, uh, say, gate sector, pure young mills. So this is uh, the typical uh, uh, term that uh, is uh, related to the uh, field uh, tensor. Uh, this is uh, the gate fixing parameter. This is the gate sector. And then, of course, uh, to make it QCD, you have to add uh, the quarks. Uh, mostly, I will be talking about the first part, so I'll be uh, talking mostly about pure young mills, but we have to make this uh, clear distinction. So there is young mills here, and then there is uh, the part that makes it uh, QCD. Now, the basic observations are uh, well known. So all fundamental fields are massless at the level of the Lagrangian. And if you have a properly regularized perturbation theory, uh, you cannot generate a mass at any finite order. Okay. And uh, nevertheless, uh, essentially, we are bringing masses. We have masses all over the place. We believe that there is a dynamical generation of fundamental mass scale in pure young mills. I will be talking about that. Then if you let it be QCD and you have the quarks, then you have the quark constituent masses. You have chiral symmetry breaking. And then, of course, there is uh, the entire zoo of particles that you have as bound states. You have mesons, hadrons, globals, hybrids, exotics, and the list goes on and on. Now, the, what I would like to study today is uh, how the effects, essentially how the effects of the mass gap manifest themselves uh, through the appearance of distinct patterns in the infrared momentum region of correlation functions. So basically, correlation functions are the building blocks for uh, most of things that we want to calculate in, uh, at least in, uh, using uh, continuum methods. And the question that we want to address is uh, to what extent and, in, and how exactly do these um, correlation functions or Green's functions uh, know, have information, receive, capture, perceive the, the generation or the appearance of a mass scale. Uh, now, um, of course, this is a purely non-perturbative phenomenon, uh, what I'm trying to describe. So uh, for the rest of the talk, we'll have a close synergy between two uh, non-perturbative tools. We'll have the swinger dyson equations on the one hand. So that will be, you can, you can generalize and say, um, uh, for example, functional methods to include uh, other methods like the, uh, the functional normalization group. Uh, but I will be mostly talking about swinger dyson equations uh, here. And then there are gates fixed lattice simulations, simulations that uh, can probe uh, Green's functions. All right. Now, about the Swinger Dyson equations, what we can say is that it is an insightful computational framework, and it amounts to studying the equations of motion for off shell uh, correlation functions. Of course, it is uh, quite cumbersome. It's well known that it's a tower of coupled nonlinear integral equations. So truncations have to be employed. And then there is the usual uh, uh, problem associated with this method that there is no obvious expansion parameter. All right. And nonetheless, uh, on empirical grounds, we uh, have come to believe that our results are robust and we trust them uh, a lot. So we can discuss this point maybe later if you, if you wish. 
Uh, now, about the gates fixed lattice simulations, uh, of course, uh, th there is not so much to say in the sense that the space time is discretized. And in principle, uh, it captures such computation simulations, capture all the physics. All right. Uh, and it does furnish the uh, right, the correct numbers and shapes when it is uh, 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 Green's functions that we're talking about. But of course, it has no obvious intuition as to what they really mean, why things come out the way uh, they do. Now, uh, I would like to talk about uh, more specifically the emergence of mass in the gate sector of QCD. Uh, so I, uh, I will just dedicate this transparency to some uh, very brief history uh, of the subject. And the whole uh, business, uh, so to speak, started back in uh, 82. It was initiated by Cornell, who uh, pointed out, he put forth the notion that the gluon surf interactions can generate a dynamical mass. And such a mass, if it were generated, it would uh, be the scale, set the scale for all other dimensional quantities like string, uh, globals, masses, and etc. Now, it took uh, many years, it took almost a quarter of a century uh, to reach the modern era. Uh, let's say the renaissance of this uh, notion. And it was uh, promoted really by Lattice QCD in the sense that um, uh, it was agreed back in to, uh, around 2007 by all Lattice groups working on this uh, subject that what they were seeing uh, on their lattices for the gluon propagator. So from now on, the gluon propagator, will, I will be not denoting it by delta. Uh, it was uh, something like uh, what you see in this uh, plot here. So the, the, the important feature, uh, which uh, somehow was the uh, characteristic signal uh, of what we will uh, attribute to the appearance of a mass was the fact that the propagator was saturated here. So it wasn't diverging. Uh, it wasn't going to zero, but it was going to some finite uh, value here. So this, this point has been scrutinized a lot by the people, the lattice people, and it has been considered to be an unequivocal signal that, that there is some sort of mass uh, generation that took place that has made this uh, saturate here. Now, if you want to understand where this comes from, say some sort of mechanism that will account for this, it is clear that uh, you cannot have, you cannot attribute it to a mass term in the Lagrangian because it is forbidden by gates invariance. So this, this part, I want to make sure that we all understand and agree that uh, I, this is crossed out as a possibility already from uh, the beginning. So all symmetries must be explicitly preserved. So you don't want to uh, do uh, funny things with your symmetries. You want to preserve uh, BRST invariance, for example. So uh, then you, you need to find a deep mechanism and we believe there is a deep mechanism that is at work and we are trying to unravel it, at least scratch the surface of it. And it seems that what we have seen uh, up until now suggests that the dynamics and the symmetry are tightly interlocked. If you can make a clear distinction between dynamics and symmetry, I will try to make such a distinction uh, later on. But let's say for now, I, I, uh, we, we uh, say that dynamics and symmetry are really uh, very uh, tightly interwoven together. Now, the mechanism that I'm talking about was invented by none other than uh, Julian Schwinger. And it was a long time ago, it was uh, back in 1962. And the statement uh, in itself is very uh, interesting because, and the title of the paper was Gates in there and Mass. So in somehow uh, it dispels certain misconceptions. Uh, and according to, this observation, a gauge boson may acquire a mass, even if the gauge symmetry forbids a mass term at the level of the fundamental Lagrangian, provided that its vacuum polarization function develops a pole at zero momentum transfer. So this, this statement may be a bit uh, convoluted, but uh, I will try to uh, break it down for you. Uh, so if um, one looks, for example, the swinger dashing equation for the gauge propagator, so just to uh, create some sort of uh, notation here. Th this is a typical Schrodinger diagram. It's not for uh, QCD. We will see uh, more complicated ones, but let's say some, some sort of toy situation where you can see uh, 
a, a, a dynamical equation uh, appearing in this uh, sense, uh, then uh, what is the propagator, the corresponding propagator of that Gates boson that one considers uh, is written like this. And uh, this capital Pi is what uh, Schrunger calls the vacuum polarization function. So it is clear that if for some reason uh, in that limit of uh, two square going to zero, this, this function uh, develops a pole, it becomes, it, it behaves like this, the way I have written here, with C being a positive residue of that pole, then it is clear that this propagator will act in, at the origin as if it had a mass, even though there was no mass in, in the first place the, at the level of the Lagrange. All right. So that was the basic uh, mechanism that uh, we, we feel there is, it's the underlying uh, mechanism. And now the question is, this being a too general a statement, because it doesn't tell you much about what causes uh, the appearance of the, the pole here, for instance, it just it merely states that if this is true, then this follows. Uh, we would like to study how, if possibly this can happen, take place in, uh, in young Mills and in QCD. All right. So now how this Schwinger mechanism will, uh, might operate in QCD, uh, the, the, the starting point now is indeed the Swinger Dyson equation for the uh, gluon propagator. So I have, I have not written the whole thing, but I have kept uh, the, the pieces that are more important for what I'm going to uh, say, just so that you can capture the idea. And there's a corresponding equation for the verdict. So you see, this is a couple system. So the, the, this uh, red uh, circle appears in various places and it is the, it, it, uh, denotes the three gluon vertex. All right. So you see it's here, here, and then there is the, the equation that it satisfies, it has its own uh, uh, structure here. And now it, it is known that uh, this, the Schwinger Dyson equation captures automatically, it has built in the perturbative expansion. All right. So if one were to try to solve uh, this system, say, without uh, being able to introduce the, the effect of a, a mass in some meaningful way, the, the answer would be something like where asymptotically you will find the, for the large, uh, say, momenta, momentum values in the deep uh, ultraviolet, you'll be finding this particular uh, behavior that you know from perturbation theory. But then as you would move uh, towards the infrared, you will uh, find uh, you will find the essentially singularity, but this singularity is what we understand as the, uh, say, the land of singularity. So you will find an instability uh, in, in your uh, theory, and then that will essentially arrest the, uh, seize the, 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 the evolution of the, the equation. All right. So uh, now, however, if the coupling gets sufficiently strong, the, the statement is that it could lead to a formation of bound states. And to show this with a figure, if I take uh, the three gluon vertex and I just plot uh, you know, a string of uh, diagrams, maybe the ladder diagrams just to have a, one particular subset. And then if the coupling is sufficiently strong and I go to the limit where the momentum entering goes to zero, uh, the, this, this figure may collapse into this, collapses into this one, where you see that uh, there is, the, what mediates this, um, the, what connects this part with this is a massless uh, pole, but it, it is a, a, a massless colored excitation. It acts as a pole in this sense, but it is uh, produced as a, as a bound state. And you notice that uh, it, it, is, uh, it has color, so it's not something that uh, you would expect to see. It doesn't appear in your spectrum, of course. All right. So uh, the, the effect of this, uh, of the appearance of such a uh, component, let's say for the, for the vertex, we're talking about this guy now. So this, this, what I'm showing will be a component of this red circle, OK? And it will enter here, here, and, and everywhere. But let's, let's study just for the moment what, what it uh, looks like, uh, and uh, I I wrote here its basic structure, and you see I call it V uh, for lack of a better term. But uh, the, the 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 what is uh, important to notice is that 
this pole, this massless uh, excitation, is uh, what we call longitudinally coupled. By that, I mean that the um, um, Lorentz index that uh, is assigned to the gluon that uh, is irrigated by the momentum Q, in this case, it's alpha, it's uh, saturated by that same momentum, all right? And now you see that this happens automatically here. In other words, I don't have to put it by hand. It happens because when this thing is uh, closes, it only has one momentum uh, Q here, the one that is entering, and there is only one Lorentz index. So by Lorentz uh, invariance, the only thing that it, it can be is proportional to Q uh, times alpha. And then there is the rest that comes from the rest of the diagram. And what we call C1 is something that we, we will stay with us for a while. So um, I, we will have to determine this. Now, you agree with me that I will have to determine this in the sense that, of course, it's like the residue in this case of this pole. It is a residue of various variables, as you can see, because it's a, it's a, it's a vertex form factor, right? But uh, the whole point boils down to whether uh, one can have or not such a non-vanishing uh, C1. Now, there are more terms that one can put here, and it has to do with the, the other channels, because this is one channel, the relevant channel that goes with the Q. It is relevant in the sense that it is the one that will provide the port here as, as, as uh, the momentum that is physical and not the one that is being integrated over is the one that has to be uh, to have the pole, all right? So, but, but because the, the vertex is both symmetric, there will be similar contributions from the other, uh, for the other channels, but they are not relevant. So we only look at this. All right, so now we want to see whether the theory assumes uh, something, it can furnish a solution uh, for a, a non-vanishing C1, all right? Now, uh, it turns out that um, actually C1 uh, in a special limit vanishes. So in the, in the soft uh, gluon limit uh, vanishes because of, uh, uh, let's say, both symmetry, all right? Because uh, this thing uh, is an anti-symmetric function of R and P, all right? But uh, that's fine. And then what one has to do is see what is the next term in the uh, Taylor expansion. So the, the next term in the Taylor expansion is what I'm writing here, all right? And I will give a name to this uh, quantity for, for, uh, for now, we'll, we'll call it fat C. Uh, there will be a better name later on assigned to it, but let's call it fat C. Now you see it's a partial derivative of this particular form factor, a q equals to zero. Now the point is that I don't want to make it too technical, but uh, so it's as technical as it will get for a while, because now imagine you're setting up an equation where this, this possibility of having such a structure appears on the left and on the right hand side, as it is typically done for a Bethesel Peter equation. So you write uh, both terms in here and here, and then you go to the limit where Q squared goes to zero. That kills lots of terms that basically you are matching uh, the poles of both sides, all right? The, the, the residues of the poles of both sides. And this matching gives rise to a homogeneous Bethesel Peter equation and for, for this particular quantity, for the fat C. So you see the, it has this form. So it's a, it's a typical uh, structure that one associates with a um, Bethesel Peter equation. And uh, now the, the question is can I find the solution under what conditions and what does it look like? So uh, now, of course, it depends, as you see on this particular kernel, and this particular kernel is a, a beast of, uh, it's a, it has four gluons, a four gluon kernel. So you can imagine it has a very uh, uh, formidable uh, tensorial uh, structure. So we're going to approximate it by the one gluon exchange. So we will only keep this term but it already captures a lot of physics. And we seem to, uh, we, we become confident that what captures quite, quite a lot actually. So you see this, this part is uh, dressed, this is fully dressed, this is fully dressed. We plug it into this equation and then we end up with this one here. So it's the same equation I wrote before, but with, this, with a, a, a very definite 
uh, kernel now in, in place of this uh, uh, K that was something more, more abstract at this point, right? Uh, so this equation can be solved and it has a non-trivial solution. Uh, and the non-trivial solution looks like what you see here. So here is the zero. If it had been, uh, let's say, trivial, and this is what it is. So it has a non-trivial structure, completely non-trivial. And uh, actually, as you solve this, you realize that it, this becomes, uh, it's clearly an eigenvalue problem. And uh, it turns out that um, uh, the eigenvalue for which this works, it translates to a value of alpha that is of the order of 0 0.3 when the renormalization point, because there is a process for renormalization, so there is a mu, a subtraction point that has to be introduced. So when this is 4.3 GV, uh, the alpha, the corresponding alpha that goes with this uh, eigenvalue is 0 0.3. Uh, I'm emphasizing this because uh, it is something a completely reasonable number. In other words, you could have gotten this for uh, say alpha equals three, in which case it wouldn't be so attractive, but you do find it in the precise uh, um, ballpark of where, where alpha lies uh, following other considerations. All right. Now, um, so if this is uh, the case and having established uh, this, now we will call temporarily this fat C, we can call it as the, the Bethesel Peter amplitude because this is what it does. It, it acts like the Bethesel Peter amplitude for this particular uh, bound state excitation. Okay. Now, uh, how this now becomes. Uh, goes to trigger the Swinger mechanism is now uh, in the sense that because the massless poles have been generated, if you plug the, the vertex, the entire vertex here with the corresponding uh, uh, component that we just generated here and here, this provides precisely the, the pole that uh, the Swinger mechanism requires. So if uh, this Paul enters here, it will do precisely uh, what uh, Schwinger said in, in a few transparencies ago. And in particular, you can show that uh, the mass, the, the, the saturation point, let's call it the point where the um, propagator, the gluon propagator will saturate, which is the M square here, it can be given, can be computed, it's a computable uh, quantity. And uh, once I have been given the C, this fat C, the Bethesel Peter amplitude, then I, I have to compute this, and this can be done, and I can get it. All right, so this determines, um, say, in a calculable way, the saturation point of the gluon propagate. So in, uh, if you compute it, yes, it comes out to be non vanishing, and it, yes, it comes to be precisely in, in the ballpark where you have your. Uh, gluon propagator saturate. You see that the propagator saturates here. There is there are some error bars here, of course, and then there's a one over m square. So it's the inverse of this value that one identifies with uh, the mass. So the gluon, in that sense, that I have just described, acquires a mass. So it has the characteristic um, behavior like uh, of saturation, um, and uh, in some sense. You, you see how this now is a solution that uh, is valid uh, for, for the entire range of momentum. So unlike what we had before from perturbation theory, where we were uh, hitting the um, Landau pole, uh, here there is no such thing. The Landau pole has been uh, cured. So in some sense, this is a self-stabilizing effect. And it is uh, a way that the theory uh, finds to, uh, to resolve let's say the, the, the infrared issues that it has. And so this is precisely uh, what happens here. All right, now, if you want to talk about masses, what is the value of this mass? Well, uh, you, you probably appreciate that the, the value uh, depends on, uh, again, on what I, where I choose to renormalize. So it's not an, at this level, at this level, the mass, this mass that I'm talking about is not, a renormalization group invariant mass. And uh, you understand if I change the renormalization, this entire curve uh, will move up and down. And so will the saturation point, 
right? So we have to keep that in mind. So the, the, the number I put here is for this particular choice of mu, and it is of the order, it's 350 plus or minus uh, 25 MeV. Now, there is a way to uh, generalize this construction and um, promote part of it, at least uh, uh, the, 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 the propagators that we have, combine them with some other structures and generate uh, what we call the, uh, the... Hello, Yanis, can I ask a question? Sure. Daniele told me that I can interrupt any time. So, Is that so? Uh, I, I wanted to ask, so the only assumption that, it looks to me that the only assumption you did to get this poll was that you simplified like the four gluon vertex with just a gluon exchange. Yes. That because, was... you, because for the propagator, you have the full equation. Then the, for this limit that you take the derivative for the two gluon vertex, you relate to the four gluon vertex. And this looked to me exact. And then the only thing you assume a one gluon exchange for the four gluon vertex. Well, this is okay. Right. Uh, the... At least for the pole. That's, yeah, that's what no, I got. For the pole, for the pole, you are absolutely right. Uh, there is this particular uh, kernel here that contains a skeleton expansion that has lots of structure. Now it seems that the structure is subleading, and uh, if you keep only the, I mean, but, but yes, uh, to answer your question, yes. The assumption at this level is that uh, I have only kept, uh, we have only kept this part of the propagator, okay? Yeah, of the kernel, sorry. And, and so this is the approximate version of, of the Bethesel-Peter equation that we're solving. Now, uh, it's not entirely true that the gluon uh, Swinger Dyson is uh, complete because I have, as I said at some point, there are some more terms here. I didn't want to bother you with the additional terms. Uh, for example, there is the ghost loop, all right? And there is a ghost vertex, and the ghost vertex also uh, creates a, a pole, but that's numerically very subleading. So I didn't want to burden you with all the structure. I just wanted to uh, present the basic idea. So uh, in, in the in the full, uh, let's say, uh, version of this equation, this is a couple system. So it is this this guy that you see here. This C and some other C that corresponds to the other vertex. All right, the, the ghost gluon vertex. Okay, so it's more complicated. I'm simplifying, but uh, I, I believe the message is exactly this. Okay. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, now, uh, I, I was saying that uh, the, 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 um, one, one can generalize uh, the Gelman low effective charts known from QED. And this we did that in, uh, with Daniela, with uh, Craig and uh, others. Uh, that was back in uh, 2017. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to enter into this uh, unless asked uh, in, in the very end. But uh, what one can get out of this is some renormalization group invariant result for this, uh, uh, for the corresponding mass, which is of the order of 430. So that's, that's basically something that can be done. So this is what uh, what happens. Okay, now I would like to um, discuss for the next few minutes uh, some of the implications of this uh, for the entire uh, field of uh, the Schrödinger Dyson equations as we understand it uh, right now. And uh, it, when we look at the Gauss sector, for example, so now th this was the gluon that we have been studying. And uh, people have been studying uh, with equal force, let's say, the, the ghost sector. Why? Because uh, there have been uh, several, let's say, um, confinement scenarios associated with this uh, sector. So it was very interesting to see what the ghost was doing, what the ghost propagator was doing correspondingly. And um, now it turns out that the swinger mechanism, uh, the way I presented it, leaves the ghost completely it's, it's the, the ghost is transparent to this mechanism, all right? And I can show you why it's transparent. You can understand immediately. If this is the equation that uh, governs the ghost, right? And if this is the, the same, this is uh, the corresponding vertex that could create 
an, a corresponding pole, right? This is the one I will, this is what I was just telling to Dionysius, that there is, there is this uh, ghost gluon vertex that uh, somehow can do the, a similar thing, but it does, but it's much smaller, but it's not the size that uh, um, makes it irrelevant for the ghost. It's the fact that uh, it is uh, longitudinally coupled, as we said. So if you're in the Lando gates, which is what we're doing, this propagator is uh, transverse. And so when it is contracted by the pole, it completely an annihilates. So it, it, it doesn't see anything of that, any of that. So it, what comes out is that the, 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 this particular uh, propagator is massless. So you see, you can write it like that. So this stays uh, without a mass. And uh, what accompanies this pole, which is called the dressing function, uh, you can show that if, if the gluon that you're putting here is massive in the sense that I described. So let's say it is infrared finite uh, with that, in that sense. I, I'll call it massive with uh, quotation marks, but let's say if it, if it does what I just uh, described more or less, then you can show that this, the, the outcome of this equation is that something that, the result of this equation is something, a quantity that will, will uh, saturate here. So what saturates is, is the F, not the D. So it is still massless, but uh, with a saturating dressing function. And here you see uh, the lattice data and, and the blue line is, is the solution of the Schumann-Dyson equation. It's not a fit. Uh, so uh, there, there is in, it is in striking agreement. Um, and now what, what emerges is uh, this particular uh, pattern where uh, you have, uh, let's say, a, a gluon that uh, has this effective uh, mass and a, a ghost that is effectively massless. And I wanted to show you uh, one situation where this particular mass generating pattern um, manifests itself and it has some uh, visible consequences other than, than this. In other words, that goes something that goes beyond what, you, what is the saturation, something that is in a completely different, uh, let's say, uh, spirit. So uh, if you look at the three gluon vertex, uh, I'm claiming that there is a dramatic confirmation of this mass generating uh, pattern. And uh, in particular, there is a suppression driven by the infrared log divergence. So I, I, want, I want to explain this because it's, um, I think it's an, an important point. So it, it, we look again at the three gluon vertex, but I'm looking at the part that has no pole. I'm looking at the pole free part. All right. Now, in the pole free part, you have uh, diagrams that have gluon loops and you have diagrams that have ghost loops, all right? And when you plug in the propagators here that have, uh, say, massive gluons, and you plug in the propagators that have massless ghosts, the outcome is different in the sense that, now I'm simplifying, I'm going to the limit where I only have one momentum so you can see it, uh, so if I only have one momentum R, let's say, the type of logarithm that I will get from these guys will be what we call protected in the sense that uh, I can take the corresponding momentum to zero. And because there is a mass, roughly speaking, accompanying this momentum, uh, even if I go to zero, this, this logarithm will give me a finite value. This is in contradistinction to what happens with the ghost loop uh, that comes from this diagram. And there is no such mass because these guys are massless, still the ingredients here. And this is an unprotected logarithm. So when I do take the R to zero in this particular part of the calculation, this is going to uh, give me, um, well, depending on the sign here, but let's say in, 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 when it's, this is positive, this gives me minus infinity, all right? so. Uh, now, it turns out that this particular, there's a balance, there's a sort of uh, 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 battle between these two contributions when one computes uh, or one, when one simulates on the lattice the corresponding form factor. So what I have created here is uh, a toy model, but uh, what I call L soft gluon is, is, is real and it has been computed on the lattice. And you see what happens. The, what you see on the lattice is precisely this uh, behavior. And this behavior 
is driven by this uh, masslessness of the ghost and it creates what we call the infrared suppression. You have to understand this uh, at three level, what I call L is one. So perturbation theory or three level is here. And then when, as you move towards uh, the lower values, uh, towards the infrared, uh, it, it drops. So why is it dropping? Because it, it's being driven by this term. So eventually it, it has a logarithmic divergence down here. And what, what this protected log does is it sort of slows down this, this evolution. So it doesn't diverge too early, uh, but it, it is suppressed, but it's not suppressed too much. So it has the Goldilocks type of uh, uh, say uh, behavior. So it, it, it is precisely suppressing the, the right amount for this to give us something that uh, we see on the left. Right and, and moreover, something that is uh, related and necessary for other uh, phenomenological, phenomenological applications. Now, this result is striking. Also, it was striking from a psychological point of view originally in the sense that people uh, were reluctant to accept it to the extent that one is accustomed to expect from QCD that in the infrared, there will be no suppression, it would be rather enhancement. So this is what happens with the quark gluon vertex. In the, with the quark gluon vertex, you have enhancement, but here you found um, a clear sign of suppression, and now we understand why. And this is essentially the the explanation that I just gave you, and you have the suppression, and then there is what we call the zero crossing. So yes, because this has to cross at some point to come from positive to minus infinity. So at some point it crosses to zero at some small value of the moment. Okay, now. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to something else related, but slightly different. So I, I say that the Swinger mechanism has a clear dynamical origin that I have just explained. It is compatible with all theoretical uh, principle and requirements and like BRST symmetry, normalizability. Okay, I have not spoken too much about this, but it's something that we, we know. Now, however, there is this natural question it was natural to us at least. Uh, is there some sort of smoking gun signal associated with the onset of this mechanism, other than the fact that it makes the gluon propagator to be infrared finite? In other words, is there something that can discriminate this from something else, some other mechanism possibly that would do the same thing? All right, so this is what we're asking. So the answer is yes. And uh, the way this uh, happens is, uh, through what we call, and I will explain in detail now. So if you don't know the term, don't, don't get alarmed. So it is the displacement of the word identity satisfied by the vertices. So this observation that I will explain in a moment, together with lattice results, purely lattice results, uh, confirm the swinger mechanism as I will show at the three sigma level. And I will explain how account sigmas and so on and so forth in a moment. Now, I emphasize the part of the lattice because uh, if I only look, use lattice ingredients in what I will uh, develop, um, I, I'm not running the risk of putting in what I want to show, right? So in that sense, we, we act as if lattice was a uh, mechanism uh, blind, so it doesn't uh, know Swinger in, a, in any particular way. So it just sums up our configurations, so it weighs them with the action and then it gives you an answer. So in that sense, we don't run this risk that I said that you may be putting in what you have already, uh, uh, you may be getting out what you have already put in. Um, so let me explain to you quickly what, what the displacement of the word identity means. Uh, and I will use a, uh, a simple example for scalar, it's scalar QED, just not because I, I think there is a swinger mechanism in scalar QED just to, to have the, 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 the say the um, uh, logistics uh, a little bit simpler, right? So that you have, we have fewer uh, Lorentz indices for one thing and we have uh, abelian structures to deal with. So that once you understand the idea at this level, then it will be easy to, to translate it to the more complicated uh, context of, uh, of the three gluon vertex. Uh, so, this is the photon uh, scalar uh, vertex, all right? 
And I call it gamma uh, with one index mu, of course. And D is the uh, propagator of the scalar. And we know that uh, there's a Takahashi identity that connects the two. So the divergence of this vertex is given by the dif this difference. And this is, at this moment, I will assume that the swinger mechanism is off. It's not activated. So this, this quantity is pole free, all right? It doesn't have a pole. So I can make a uh, Taylor expansion of both sides. This is a textbook way of getting from the Takahashi identity, the word identity. So you just expand uh, Taylor expansion on both sides, and then you get to this uh, simple answer that I have here. And if now you make one more step and you say, I want to study the tensorial decomposition of this vertex, well, it's clear that uh, it can only have one uh, component. There's only one tensorial structure, and I call L the component. Uh, and so I can relate, I can plug here, and I can relate uh, this component with uh, the, the inverse of, of the, with the derivative of the inverse of, of the uh, scalar propagator. Okay, so this is a simple result, as simple as you can get. And now I want to see what happens to this result if um, the swinger mechanism is on. So if the swinger mechanism is on, now my, my vertex, the corresponding thing here is, uh, I call it fat gamma, and it will be some sort of pole free part as before, but then I will have this additional term. Okay, so this now, if I, uh, at this point, I will make two, two steps. So the first step is to act with Q mu on both sides. So this is what I get. So you see that act by acting with Q mu, it kills the pole. And I am left with a C, the, the, the um, residue. And it is still equal to this side because I have not changed. There's no, nothing that has changed the Takahashi identity. The Takahashi identity retains its form. It is just that it is uh, realized or resolved, if you wish, uh, by means of a pole. There is a pole in this uh, contribution here. Okay, so once we, we, we agree on that, then I can come here and, and look at these two pieces, two, two parts of the equation, and I can repeat the Taylor expansion. And you will see that I get the same answer that I had before up until this point, but then there's an extra term that comes from taking the derivative of this, right? And lo and behold, this derivative is precisely the corresponding thing to what we called before the C, the fat C, all right? It's the corresponding fat C for this particular vertex, all right? So then the, this relation that we had here, relating the form factor with the propagator is modified by this amount, and this amount is what we call the displacement. Now you notice, this I call displacement, and it at the same time is the Bethesel-Peter amplitude that we, we discussed maybe uh, 10 minutes ago, okay? So now my statement is, and I want to make it clear that we understand this, to make sure that we understand this. Now, let's imagine that we, are, uh, we could compute these things on the lattice. So, uh, Let's, I want to, to convince you that this, this L is what the lattice uh, measures, simulates. In other words, the lattice simulates the pole free part of the vertex because the pole part is transparent to the lattice. Why is that? It is because, now I'm doing it again for the three gluon vertex. Don't be scared, there are more indices, but it's the same idea. The lattice computes things like that. So you have a full vertex, you uh, multiply it by three, or well, in this case, three, but as many gluon legs as you have, you uh, multiply it by the corresponding projector operators uh, for each leg. So the projector operator is this. And the moment you do that, and you substitute for gamma fat, the pole free part and the poles, because we said that the poles are longitudinally coupled, they satisfy this condition. Okay, so the whatever form factor you are computing here, it is only sensitive to the uh, thin gamma, which is the pole free part, this thing. All right, so now if I go back, having said that, if I go back, you see what I can 
do if, if I can, if the lattice can give me this and the lattice can give me this and let's say with good precision and I can put them together, the question is, will I get this or will I get something else? And this something else, if there is a discrepancy, I could attribute it to uh, precisely the displacement. So this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to do it for the real thing, which is the three gluon vertex. Now, the three gluon vertex satisfies a complicated, uh, it's not the Takahashi identity, it's called the Slavno Taylor identity, but it is the same idea, only with uh, more stuff here that comes from the ghost sector. There is this, uh, well, we said what the F is, the dressing function of the ghost. The H is another beast, it's the ghost gluon kernel. This is typical structure that appears in the Slavno Taylor identity. So it is an, an additional complication. But once you basically work out the details, you can show that the displacement, uh, this fat C, uh, it is given by this formula. And I will tell you what its ingredient is. Well, this we said what it is. This, this is this guy. We, we just saw this. This is the form factor of the three gluon vertex that has been simulated on the lattice and has this suppression. Okay. So that we know from the lattice. This guy is the ghost dressing function, which yes, we've seen that. So it's just the value of this uh, function at the origin, all right? Now, the inverse delta and the derivative of inverse delta, this is just the gluon propagator. This is the gluon propagator from the lattice again. This is the inverse. And then you have to take this, we'll plug it in and take the derivative of this uh, curve and then plug it in. Now, what's the W? The W is, the messy part that comes from the fact that you have this uh, extra structure, the, the ghost kernel, and it is a derivative, a partial derivative of this ghost kernel. It's not interesting uh, to define it in, any better. Uh, what you need to know is that this doesn't come from the lattice. This is the only ingredient that doesn't come from the lattice. I have to compute this using its own Schrodinger dyson equation. So, with the exception of uh, this guy, everything else is given to me by the lattice on this uh, right-hand side. And now I have to do a little bit of work to uh, get some reasonable approximation for this guy. And this uh, function looks like this and the arrow bars, as you can see this blue uh, band is not too bad. Um, so now when, I, when, I, when we put everything together, what happens? So the question is, okay, so I plug all these ingredients here. Do I get a zero or do I get something else? And if I get something else, does it look like anything that I have seen before? All right. So the displacement function that comes out of this, so when, when I plug here, what comes out is the blue curve and the band is the corresponding error. All right. And here I have superimposed what you have seen before in this talk, namely the solution of the Bethesel-Peter equation for the same quantity, right? So the purple is the fat C coming from the Bethesel-Peter equation, whereas the, the blue is the fat, C, the fat C coming from the word identity in that sense that I have described here. So you see, this is uh, excellent agreement no, uh, because this is important because imagine you do all this and then it comes out some sort of funny function here that has nothing to do with uh, the, or the C that you get, get from the um, bethesel peter equation. That would be disappointing, but this is not what happened. All right, so you see we're in this situation here. Okay, so this is good. And I want to emphasize it's a completely independent way of getting the fat C because this uh, basically is a completely asymmetry sort of argument. It doesn't, uh, I haven't put any dynamics really in uh, other than the calculation of this part. All right, that's, that's the only dynamics that I put from, from my own, let's say, uh, tools. All right, so now, all right. I would like to see if I can assign some sort of uh, statistical significance to what we have seen. Uh, and uh, this is uh, why I said at some point that we have a three sigma 
uh, confirmation, I want to show you what I mean by that. Uh, so let's suppose for a moment that I introduce the null hypothesis, which is when, when C fat is zero. So let's suppose, suppose that the C was zero. All right. So now I, I will go here, put zero, and uh, see what uh, L, what form factor of the vertex uh, would uh, be compatible with the rest. So in other words, if I keep everything that goes in here fixed and this becomes zero, uh, I have to absorb the change somewhere. And if I decide to absorb the change into the form factor, this tells me that the form factor that the lattice gave me, which was going like this, it would have to be up here. All right. So the null hypothesis, if, if the null hypothesis were true, for the lattice ingredients to be compatible, uh, the form factor had to be up here and not down here. All right. So now, with this observation, we can actually uh, make some sort of statistical analysis because we want to compute uh, what is the distance, all right, between uh, these two curves, okay? And now I, will, I want to show you how I measure, how we measure this distance. So I, I'm coming here and it's, it's a bit difficult to see maybe, but these are the two curves and its uh, point has assigned a particular error. All right, there are the error bars that this uh, curve has here, the lattice error bars, all right. So we use that at a given point as the unit uh, that measures the standard deviation, the, the unit that measures in some sense the distance of this curve. So it is a, a sliding scale, if you wish, because it changes from point to point, right? So uh, if we this, this, if we find the little delta to be the distance divided by this particular unit at any given moment, at any given point, rather. Uh, this gives me a reasonable way of uh, defining the distance between these two curves. And then I can play the following game. I can say, I will um, organize my points in bins, in energy bins, momentum bins, all right? And I want to see what's the average uh, delta that I have in uh, for its uh, bin. All right, so I can do that. And there are a total of 532 points, lattice points, lattice data. And you see how they are distributed in the momentum bin. So it goes from zero to 4.5, around here somewhere it ends, 4.5, you see. And so this, this has been mapped here and the height of its, uh, uh, box is precisely the average delta that we have, all right, the average distance for a given bin. And then if I want to find what is the total average, all I have to do is find the, take the delta for each uh, point, at each point, and then sum it up and divide it by the number of points. And you see, it comes out to be about 3.1. Now, this is, uh, a picture that I'm showing you where, where the momentum uh, discrimination uh, takes in. In other words, I can, you can see that there, uh, how, how the delta or the statistical significance varies uh, as a function of momentum. Now, if I don't care about momentum, if I only say, I want to just compute how many points are in bins of a given sigma and I don't care how much momentum they have. All right, I can do that. So I fix the bin, I fix the size of the, of the sigma, the, the standard deviation, let's say. I want to say how many points I have at one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, and so on and so forth, independently of uh, where they are uh, momentum wise. So what comes out is this, and you see that Yes, there is a big concentration of 193 points in this region. So yes, this makes sense because it accounts for the fact that uh, the average is around 3.1. And then you see that we have some uh, 
we even have 10 sigma type of uh, situation, but okay, the, the main point of this is that there is a, a clear uh, signal here at around uh, three sigma that, that will uh, um, say that somehow this, this uh, is this, the statistical significance uh, that discriminates the null hypothesis from what happens. All right, okay, now. Um, I will. I, I have practically come to the end, so I will just uh, want to give you my uh, conclusions. Um, now, the I hope I have uh, convinced you that uh, the gluon self interaction generated dynamical mass scale in the gate sector of QCD, and uh, it is my opinion that the dynamics and the symmetry are tightly intertwined. And this is not just a philosophical statement. We have seen it uh, in a tangible way at the level of this uh, particular uh, quantity, the, the fat sigma, if you wish, uh, where the displacement of the word identity is equal, identical, to the bethesel peter amplitude for the pole formation. So this is a striking uh, feature. So it is sort of, um, difficult to think that there is an accident here. Um, then we have seen that there is a smoking gun signal confirmed at the three sigma level in the sense that I have just uh, described. And in some sense, it seems as if one really has truly masses from nothing. This is essentially what this uh, suggests from, again, a philosophical point of view, but then perhaps it's not so surprising because if, uh, according to one of my favorite uh, quotes of uh, Richard Feynman, all mass is uh, interaction. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yanis, for the nice talk and for keeping the time. So you avoided me to intervene. Yes, really. Which is good. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. Yes, exactly. So, so I see Stan as his uh, hand raised. So, Stan, please ask a question if you have one. Hi, Stan. Hi there. Good to see you. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in your talk, but uh, I, I'm confused about one point. And this, you replaced in the beginning of your discussion in the when you analyzed the four gluon coupling. You you put the four gluon coupling as a simple pole, and. Uh, let, let that was go. a crucial point of the calculation in the beginning is that you, you just simply eliminated the full four gluon interaction, K1, kappa, K11 in there. And ah, you just yes. It. You All right, so it. here, 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 you mean yeah. this kernel? Yes. Yeah, right there. That kernel, you replace it by one gluon exchange. Yes. Uh, but I, the I, problem, I, right, my question is. Here. That, that one gluon, there it is right there. So it's a function of R minus K squared. So in principle, if I just was calculating that naively, I put in the alpha, I put in the running coupling of QCD at R minus alpha strong of R minus K squared. And then now I don't, you know, we know from physics, we might guess what that looks like, but we have to know what it looks like in the infrared. And if I just take the perturbative solution, then an alpha strong itself will be, Will in fact diverge. Yes, I mean, yes. It has, it has asymptotic freedom at high Q, at high Q, at high off shellness R minus k squared. But it, but it is it finite in in the domain. I mean, it seems to me well, you completely well, assume that it's finite. Sure. No, I'll, I'll I'll tell you what happens here. If you, of course, the, this exchange here, uh, you you it can be precisely replaced. If you wish, by the by the effective charge, by the running coupling. Yeah, that's now, my word. If you if you if you do a perturbative calculation, it will you will run into the same problem. You have the lambda pole. So what you put there, what you put there is the finite propagator. In other words, yes. it will be like saying I'm putting here your coupling, the one that saturates, or the one we have with Craig. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it exactly this, but it will be the equivalent of, of plugging in a finite quantity. That's and right. So that so my question, doesn't that implicitly assume that how the mass scale comes in? Because you know, what you if you assume that alpha strong is a constant 
at low momentum like it is in light frontalography, then you've already put in a mass scale right there because you say where the running couple well, the mass scale will enter, the, the mass scale will enter through renormalization uh, assuming that alpha does what we say it does it is one way of doing it but the point is you could find a situation where the, the finiteness of this the finiteness of this doesn't guarantee that this will have a, a solution that's the thing it doesn't necessarily imply that this this will have an non, non-vanishing solution so I agree with you on the following. What I sh what the perfect way of doing it is to couple everything this, in other words, go back to the system and solve yeah. it sim simultaneously. So by the time you start doing this, you should see that there is a pole coming up and then there is something that stabilizes the, the couplings and the masses at the same time. I mean, the, the propagators at the same time. But this is too, too hard to do right now. You understand? So we're we're using the the ingredients of the that come from the lattice. In other words, here for the propagator, let's not put it. I mean, in other words, if if you don't, maybe it's not a, a useful way. Well, I mean, it might be better to, to to put it in terms of propagators. We're using this propagator here, right? Yes, that's all right. right. So that is tantamount to using that other coupling that we said before. You, the the finite coupling, yes. So uh, this is absolutely true that we're using here a, a, a propagator that has this structure. And what comes out is something that supports this, this assumption. So I, I agree it's self-consistent, but the question is whether the logic is, I mean, your, your goal is to show that in fact that a mass scale arises and the mass, the moment you implicitly assume it, the running coupling is constant low scale, you've assumed in fact that the that there is a mass scale. I mean, it's sort of. I'm just wondering if the argument is yeah, circular. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I agree with you in, in the sense that it, it, whether you call it running coupling or whether you call it uh, the thing is, I, I can tell you one thing. If you um, let's put it this way, let's let's go back to this. Let let's see if I can find this propagator. If okay. you don't, if you use here as an input. As anything that doesn't have a lambda pole, even if it doesn't saturate, in other words, I can take it, I can make up a propagator that goes like this up until a certain point, and then it turns over and goes to the zero. All right, for example, that wouldn't affect uh, substantially the outcome of this analysis. So, in other words, it's not the finiteness of the propagator that makes that uh, equation have solutions. It's uh, the fact that I'm putting something that at least evades the Landau pole and it allows me to calculate because otherwise I, I cannot calculate, right? Well, sure. Yeah. But that's, I'm just saying it implicitly, you've assumed that you, you make an assumption that, that's consistent with your answer, but, but can, we, can you avoid? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the, the, the answer, the answer is more, I mean, if you focus on the, presence of or absence of a uh, of, of the Landau pole, I agree with you. In other words, mm -hmm. if I put any answer, any finite answer that I can put here that doesn't have the Landau pole, I'm assuming that there has been a uh, stabilization mechanism that yeah. took place. Yeah, yes. I, I agree with you 100%. So any, any finite thing that I plug in, it's assuming something like that. Absolutely, yes. Now, ultimately, Ultimately, uh, one should do that simultaneously and dynamically in the sense that uh, by the time you couple this genuinely, by genuinely, I mean, uh, because this is solved in pieces as you appreciate it. So uh, one, one comes here, they, we solve this, we get it out, we plug in the propagator that uh, is reasonable, right? We yes. get, uh, we get uh, the solution. Uh, we plug it into back into the equation and that generates a mass. So what you want eventually is to be able to do that simultaneously as a genuine uh, coupled system. We are, uh, we're working on this. Okay. Yeah. So the full yeah, kernel yeah. course includes ladder graphs, cross graphs, and so on. I mean, well, the, the, the full uh, thing, uh, this, this thing has, yeah. The next, the next thing is the four gluon vertex. That's right. And the thing is at three level, it turns out that, that um, there's some um, 
sort of helicity mismatch that the four gluon vertex doesn't at three level doesn't do anything. It gives zero in this particular uh, uh, setup. So, it, but the, what comes after that, it, it, it is there. But we, 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 it seems, it seems that it's not doing much. Okay. Uh, may I just add, add one more interesting point? I was just thinking Please. about during your talk, and that is, suppose instead of you use light front gauge, which mm. is frame independent and has no ghosts. Yes. Uh, would, have you thought about trying to do your analysis in a ghost-free gauge like light front gauge? You know, the complication is you get the the light front instantaneous interaction. So that would be it. Give you a new perspective on. Uh, Absolutely on yes. No. Uh, the thing is, yes and no because. Okay. I, I'll tell you in what sense. Uh, yes, of course, I have thought of that and we have discussed it. I mean, you mentioned it in, pre in other previous talks that I gave. It's just that uh, the, um, the tensorial structure that one gets for the light cone propagator is a bit um, discouraging. It has, yes. yes. Right. Well, it's got the, it has, of course, the, the instantaneous one over K plus squared interaction. That's why it's so, so. Right, so, so then, 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 and then the, the, there's another downside that uh, somehow, doesn't have any, at least I'm, I'm not aware of any lattice simulation of this quantity no. that would give us some clue whether we are doing something reasonable or not. So in that sense, uh, this has thwarted uh, any, any progress in that direction because we, we felt that it was too risky. Okay. Of course, I, I just add in, in light front holography, one uses that gauge, so there are no ghosts. And then you yes. have, yes. but you introduce, of course, the, the dilaton, but that leads in, in mm. fact to the finite running coupling at low scales and, and color confinement. So, and, and as well as the full Reggie spectrum of, of hadrons and dynamics. So somehow that, the interaction of the dilaton from the fifth dimension is, you know, solves all these problems, but there's no, I agree that, that you know, that's an ansatz. It's not in the QC Lagrangian itself. Well, yes. And but it's consistent with everything we know. Yeah. yeah, no, Lattice, the Lattice has given us a lot of guidance in this. And so we, we thought we keep it close to what the Lattice can uh, do to help us, yes. Okay. Well, I just said light from holography, uh, Guy raising his hand, uh, that it gives also guidance on how the, how the theory works because it re replicates the full hadron spectroscopy, ah, mesons, yes, sure, and sure. and so on. Sure. So, but, but, so but, it's, it's another guidance, but it's, but it's not derived from the QCD Lagrangian itself. It requires an, an ansatz from ADS space. Is okay, it, I'm sorry, I'll the, stop Is talking. it true that you don't have a gluon in this description? Oh, you do, sure, of course. You do? And, we, oh. and we calculate gluon distributions and, and stuff like that. Hmm. Okay. Right. No, because in some previous, Talk you had told me that we haven't uh, emphasized the gluons, yeah. yes, but, yeah, but, but they're there, yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's, there's another question by G. G. You can unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, Joannis, how are you? Hi, it's so nice to, to see you. It's, thank you. Who, uh, who, who, uh, who is asking? G. G. De Taramo. Ah, hi, G. Yes, how are you? So well, last time I saw you in Valencia. It was in Valencia, yes. Yeah. Well, about, about this uh, infrared finiteness problem, yes. which is crucial, uh, I, I just wanted to, to uh, point out a, a very new uh, uh, article uh, just uploaded to archive by Gao and Yamada. Uh, which precisely uh, assume uh, an, an infrared fixed point. Oh, and Yamada. Uh, yeah, Yamada and Gao. I, I will send the, the, oh, okay. the, the in, a, in a moment. So um, they assume infrared finiteness as, as mm -hmm. well, but in the sense of a Wilson, Wilson Fisher fixed point in uh, non perturbative renormalization. Mm -hmm. And this is a very nice paper oh. uh, be, because then the scale. Uh, um, uh, the scale is uh, equated with the holographic variable, uh, hmm. which we know is the right, uh, the right uh, thing to do. And um, what, what they find is that if they assume infrared fittedness, the consequence of that is uh, 
obtaining the our our potential in in you know holography so that's a very new and nice oh all right and and in this sense the uh, the ats um dilaton mentioned by stan uh is is would be just a consequence of assuming infrared thinness. Mm -hmm. So, so here I see a, a parallel with your could be with could your be work. Parallel. Yes, Good. yes. So I, I will send a. a Look, I, I will send can a, help, uh, a pointer. Up, uh, and since it's, you are here and Stan is here, I can't help putting up my backup uh, transparency on the effective chart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, and, that, and this that was... we have talked about it uh, occasionally in the past, but. Uh, we we have also here a striking coincidence between the holographic and the yeah. and what we get. We yeah. never we never managed to establish the, the, the why if there was a more profound reason that uh, was was making this happen. But uh, yeah, all right, yes, yeah, uh, but correct, yeah, correct. but essentially the infrared hiddenness is is so important. As, yes, as you have mentioned in your very nice talk. Yes, I'm I'm going to send this reference in a second. Thank you okay? very much, uh, Guy. Okay, nice to see you. Bye bye. Same here. So any more questions? I have some, but uh, I will discuss them offline because otherwise no, no, it's too many. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, one thing that I wanted to ask you is this three sigma thing, right? Yes. I mean, uh, somehow there is some uh, approximation that you make for this closed gluon kernel, right? Which looks like a systematic error that you have there. So, <laughs> <clears throat> if if you would take that in, I mean, if you would take that into account, would this three sigma change yeah. go down a little bit or what? We have uh, played with this, and uh, the the thing is, within let's put it this way: for uh, yeah, in 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 our paper we have uh, three versions of this W. There is there is precisely the W star we call it well I, if i'm not mistaken anyways there is a w that will do the same thing in other words if you say okay no i'm not going to blame the, the difference on the on here so i will keep this where it is and i will blame the difference on the w right so say say you don't know maybe maybe the problem is that you don't know how to compute this w well no. and uh, all right so the w goes down here i'm not sure if you can see my cursor anyways it does something that perhaps uh, it doesn't look too spectacular. Uh, it does something like this. And the thing is with the known physics, with the known ingredients and stretching the ingredients, well, what enters here, let's put it this way. What enters here is uh, propagators that we know and vertices that we know maybe not uh, very well, but we have a sort of a range of how much you can stretch it. There was no way to get to reach values or uh, shapes for this uh, W that would um, uh, that could account for the to, could absorb the entire all the sigmas to make the null hypothesis be true, right? So of course, if your question is, if I knew the sig, in other words, I, what I'm saying is what may go away or may, what may be modified is the amount of sigma. Yes, it could become some other number. 2.5, I don't know, but not nothing too, 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 too dramatic. I don't expect anything too dramatic here. Now, the sad part is that, uh, well, I, actually, the, the lattice may not be able to do that. I don't think they can do that. Uh, what they can do is uh, map the region of, uh, uh, in other words, what, what enters in, in, in the calculation depends on uh, some kinematics of vertices that the lattice could access. And we are, we're trying to do this with, um, well, we are trying, I mean, he's trying to do that, uh, Pepe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Ralf. Hello. Yeah, question there too, just kind of to make sure that I'm understanding that right. Uh, so with the emergence of mass, we really kind of uh, have learned quite nicely how we can understand uh, better uh, how the strong interaction is creating mass. And now in your talk, you are talking about the gluon interaction um, setting a mass scale. Okay. Uh, the main thing 
that was always a problem before too, and I think still is, is that we don't know the mass scale. Do you see uh, an uh, any possibility going forward to really kind of set the mass scale from first principles? And if not, in which way is it so different from what we know from the Dyson-Springer equation calculations uh, with respect to the walk ma uh, the, the meson and, and uh, baryon masses? Well, it, it, I'm not, I don't know how to, if you're asking how to get the mass, I, I wouldn't know how, what to... You know, the question really kind of is, is there, is there a path forward um, so that for me, and again, I'm, I don't want to be disrespectful from all the good work that you're doing. It's kind of just from a very naive experimentalist point of view, uh, kind of trying to understand. For me, it's kind of from that point, naive point of view, intuitive, that uh, glue and gluon interaction kind of has to generate mass. If there would be now a way kind of to calculate from glue and gluon interaction the mass scale with which I kind of would have normalized everything according to baryons and the mesons, uh, that would be huge. Um, but the question is, can we do that? I, I, in principle, I think we should, but I don't know how to do it myself. But now, whether what you say is an experimentalist, you, <laughs> you think that it's obvious that uh, the self-interaction will generate a, a mass scale, that's, that's great, but uh, many theor theoreticians didn't uh, know that or didn't think the okay. same way like a few years back. So, um, you know, there has been a uh, shift in the philosophy and the, uh, the entire at attitude. In other words, right now, uh, I, I know I didn't uh, interpret this uh, disrespect, anything that you uh, said. Uh, I, you, you have to take into account there has been a lot of uh, bias uh, in the past using the term mass. I mean, the term mass itself uh, was somehow, uh, there, it had a negative connotation. So it took like uh, 20 years to, uh, of hard work, not only at the level of calculations, but like giving seminars, talking to people, trying to explain that, no, I don't mean a naive mass. I don't mean a stupid mass. I mean something that, whatever, you know, all, all, the, all the qualities that you can associate. So in that sense, being able to do it at the level, uh, even at the level that I'm doing it, uh, I think it's a step uh, forward. Now, to, to actually get a, a unique mass out of the, I mean, the mass out of this, I, I, I wouldn't know how to do it. I mean, this would be the, the holy grail of this, obviously. And th this is what probably will get you the, the $1 million prize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the by the clay mathematics uh, institute but yep. um the, the the thing is the fact that we can do it you see in in the past the um, all the a lot of the the analysis was based on stringer dyson equation so as far as the tool is concerned we are using the same tools but um you see here we're, we're closer to qcd in that sense we're we're, we're one step closer to we're, we're using we're not using any models. I mean, we use models to the extent that we make approximations, but not models in the sense that we put, um, what, like uh, the, the Tandimaris interaction, for example, things like that. We're using a sort of um, QCD derived ingredients. Yes. So in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's good that we can establish the appearance of such mass um, being one step closer to, to, to young meals. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> sure. Okay. And to conclude, a short comment or question by Pepe. Pepe. Yeah. Yes. No, you're there. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Can you, can you, can you listen to me now? Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, 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 <clears throat> sorry. Good afternoon, everybody, and especially Janice. I think it, it was a very nice talk, a very inspiring. So uh, I would like just to ask something about the curiosity. Can you show me again the plus? The, sorry, the, the slide when uh, I 
I can see the when you, you show the comparison of uh, LSG, what the, the form factor with and without the displacement. Yes. This that one, that one exactly. So I mean, I don't know if I were understood the one that what you call L zero is exactly what you compute with the lattice part, assuming that the displacement is zero. Yes, exactly. Okay. So it says that if the displacement were zero, uh, yeah. your lattice should give me this. Yeah, because you took from the lattice where you took is everything the, else. Everything else being equal. In other words, yeah. Yeah. If I don't change the delta, and if and I don't the, change the f, okay. And if I blame it all, all the change on 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 this form factor, okay. where would it go? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I understand now. Okay. No, because at some point it was it's very striking anyhow. You know, it seems to 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 tell us that you need the displacement there, otherwise it's impossible. But it's also true that I was st strong at the very beginning because it's not I mean, at, the at the randomization point, the form factor should be one. It's not one even there. So, you know. Well, you mean this one? Exactly, that one. Because in the way you combine the pieces, the you randomization- You're point. saying, at, at, well, your oh. Well, yeah, no, because I mean, somehow. One, uh, well, yeah, sure. I mean, at 4.3, you, you, you say you are one and this is not one. Yeah, sure, exactly. Because you know why? Because the tails still, if you look at this, at 4.3 is not zero yet. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. This is what I'm saying. That's it's a game. I mean, it's, it's a signal you can also, uh, uh, you know, uh, take there. Because even at the remission point, it, should be the same, it's not zero as you said, yeah. and it is not. So at that point, you are just somehow finding sort of uh, indication that you need exactly. something. Yes, something exactly, exactly. Needed. And but if you, as, as, I, as I told to the, now, now you're committed, I hadn't seen that you were here. <laughs> I, 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 when I said that Pepe is doing it. Yeah, I didn't know I was doing that. <laughs> I, 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 I you thought, should talk, guys. <laughs> I, I thought I was trying to to sort of make you make a force you to make a commitment, uh, a public commitment that you are doing it. But now you're you're making a public denial. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's not true. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> I didn't know exactly what we were doing. It's also uh, Fernando and, and Feliciano are also there, and they are trying to improve all this. So it's a sort yes. of a general commitment of people that could try to look at this uh, in a deeper way. Yes, Anyhow, please. Please. And how, what they would say is that, no, I think it's, it's already very strict in the sense that uh, what you call smoking gun is, seems to be really one because it's, it's rather strict in that uh, this displacement should be there. I mean, it should be there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Daniele, we have to wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so all right. thank you very much, everybody. So it was a pleasure. Yeah. And I'll see you around in, yeah. some, in some workshop, hopefully face to face. <laughs> yeah thank you very much for uh, to everybody again for participating and uh, we have a seminar next week so with uh, with craig so if you want i will circulate the the details for connecting